Hi, everybody. My name is Iskar Kilgore from New York City Emergency Management, and we are very happy that we are joined by the fire department today for a joint presentation on fire preparedness and emergency preparedness. Uh, I would ask that uh, if you have questions, we are going to answer them at the end. You can put them in the Q&A section of this webinar in the WebEx, uh, and we'll get to them after the presentation. So now, before uh, to begin, I want to introduce Captain Michael Kozel from the fire department, who is going to speak about fire safety. Captain Kozel? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Captain Mike Kozel, um, as is Chris said, with the uh, New York City Fire Department's Fire Safety Education Unit. Um, and we're here to go over a little bit of fire safety. We're going to go over a little bit of uh, some of the common causes of fires, uh, what we're seeing statistics wise, uh, how to avoid those fires from happening to you, um, and what to do if it does happen. Uh, and this is definitely information you can share with. Um, you know, your friends, your family, and anybody close to you. So uh, some of the things that we're going to see here uh, that we're talking about right here is uh, prevention, early detection, and planning. And those are things that I'm going to go over uh, with you um, today. So, Captain, you now have a uh, full, sorry. So, Captain, now you have full control of the slides, so you can click or Use your arrow keys however you want, and when you're done, we'll take it back from you. Okay, sounds good. But um, she ain't moving. Oh. No. No movement. I will move for you, no worries. All right, so the um, just a few quick statistics. I'm going to fly by these real quick. But uh, in 2019, we had 66 fire deaths in New York City, uh, which was a 25% decline from 2018, where we had 88 fire deaths. Um, so that's a good, uh, a good trend. We're, we're continuing to uh, decline in fire deaths, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, in 2017, and we're trying to get some uh, updated statistics, it's really difficult uh, from the fire marshals, but uh, the top three causes of fatal fires in 2017 were electrical, cooking, and smoking. Um, and those three causes seem to be the top three causes um, in these recent years, 18 and 19 as well. Um, so that's what we're seeing right now, and we're going to go over those um, you know, in the slides, in the following slides. Um, just a few facts about these fires. Most of these fires are occurring between midnight and 8 a.m. Uh, when people are sleeping uh, in the kitchens, bedrooms, and during the colder winter months uh, when people are using space heaters and resorting to alt or alternate mo uh, means of heating their homes. Um, you know, we do see uh, the faulty electrical wiring, the smoking, the space heaters, like I said, um, and things like that. So we go on. Um, so some of the circumstances that contribute to the likelihood of a fatal fire victim, right? And, and it says here, no operable or audible smoke alarm to provide an early warning. And that's one of the most important things that we want people to get out of today uh, is the importance of the smoke alarms. And I'm going to go over that in detail in a little while. Um, having an inappropriate evacuation response, including attempt to fight the fire. Uh, and again, there is certain times where maybe you can get away with doing that. Uh, and we're going to go over those instances uh, as well. Re-entering the fire building is something that we talk to the children about all the time, and we always tell them, uh, once you get out, stay out, no matter what. Um, the failure to have and uh, have practice a fire escape plan, right? Uh, the time to figure out how you're going to get out of this building is not when the apartment's on fire, right? It's too late at that point. You should already have that planned in advance. And we do see some still people blocking uh, their escape routes, so we want to make sure that you keep the escape routes clear as well. So going on um, to fire prevention, we're going to get into cooking fires, which again is the leading cause of fires and fire injuries uh, is unattended cooking when we're talking about the kitchen. 
um, meaning that people are walking away from the kitchen as they're cooking, right? They have something on the stove and they walk away. So we want to make sure that we're not doing that. Um, you never want to leave cooking food unattended is what we're talking about. So if you're, you know, and, and I get it, you know, we're all trying to multitask. We're trying to do a bunch of things at the same time. And cooking is just not one of those things that you should be doing while you're trying to watch TV in the other room or you're trying to take a shower, or help somebody with homework and, you know, do five different things at the same time. Cooking shouldn't be one of those things. So uh, you want to make sure that if you're going to cook that that's specifically and solely what you do. Um, the pot handles, turning this pot handles uh, inward from the front of the stove, right? Uh, what happens is you're in a rush and, you know, there's people walking around the kitchen. You have children around maybe and the handles dangling over the stove. And what happens is people get curious. The kids get curious. They try to reach up and grab the pan. Next thing you know, they're grabbing the handle and whatever's inside is pouring all over them. Or you're trying to flip around the kitchen real quick and you bump into the handle and you knock it over and you yourself get burned. So you want to turn those handles inward so nobody bangs into them. Uh, and something that we do see a lot with the senior population is the clothing that they're wearing. A lot of people, uh, especially the older people, are getting up with robes on or baggy clothing, baggy sweatshirts to keep themselves warm. Uh, and what happens is the, the clothes are dangling over the stove and they're lighting themselves on fire. Uh, so we do recommend that you wear short sleeves or tight-fitted clothing or roll up your sleeves uh, when you are cooking to avoid that from happening. Um, obviously, uh, you know, and this is pretty simple is to keep anything that can catch fire away from the stovetop, right? You shouldn't have paper towels, newspaper, stuff like that on the stovetop. There's been quite a few buildings that we've gone into, fires that we've gone to, where people are storing things in their stove. They're storing newspapers in their stove, uh, in their oven and stuff like that. Obviously, you can't be doing things like that. Um, and obviously, never any kind of metal, aluminum or anything else in a microwave and that picture right there is pretty accurate of what's going to happen if you do put those things in the microwave. So avoid that at all costs. Uh, definitely uh, worth mentioning is Local Law 117, uh, which took effect uh, in December of 2018, which states, and I'll specifically read this verbatim, the owner of a multiple dwelling must provide stove knob covers for gas-powered stoves in a unit where a child under six years of age resides. Also, they must provide stove knob covers in a unit without a child under six if the tenant requests them. This came from a fire uh, in the Bronx that happened a few years ago. Um, and um, what happened was it was uh, 13 people lost their lives and it was the result of a child playing with the stove. Uh, and that's where they came up with this local law to put these stove knob covers on top so that uh, the children can't play with these uh, stove knobs. Uh, so that's definitely uh, something worth mentioning to anybody that you know to take advantage of that local law. Uh, a few things you want to keep in mind, uh, keep on hand when you are cooking. You want to make sure that you have an oven mitt uh, and that you have a cover, a lid to the pan uh, that you're cooking with. Uh, if you do have a small stovetop fire, you want to turn off the stove. If you can, take the baking soda. You should have, always have baking soda around. Take baking soda and pour it over the entire pan. Smother that fire with the baking soda, right? This ain't the time to take the measuring cup and start measuring out baking soda and get cheap with the baking soda, right? Don't be stingy. Take the baking soda, pour it all over this pan to make sure you cover the whole pan. Uh, and then you take the lid and you slide the lid over the pan. Keep it over that pan and smother that fire. What you're going to do is you're going to take the oxygen away and you're going to put the fire out. One thing you don't want to do is get curious and start poking your head into the into the pan, lifting the cover and poking your head in. Um, what's going to happen is you're going to get your, uh, your eyebrows done. It's not going to be pretty, right? That fire is going to blow torch right out of that pan because what you're doing is you're introducing oxygen and that fire is gonna come right out of there. So leave the cover on the pan for uh, no less than five minutes. You'll start to see some white smoke coming out of it. That tells you that the fire is, uh, is going out and, uh, and you'll be good to go. Um, so one of the things we do talk about also that is worth having on hand is a fire extinguisher. Uh, and just real quickly, you wanna make sure that you have the appropriate fire extinguisher. So, what it has here is just a little breakdown of what the different types of extinguishers do. And this one is talking about the different types of class, the classes of fire, an A, a B, and a C. And what you want is an ABC extinguisher. So that will extinguish all three types of those fires that you see uh, on that chart there. And on the extinguisher, it'll say ABC extinguisher. Uh, so that's definitely good for uh, anything household, any kind of household fire that you may encounter. Um, you wanna make sure that you're checking 
the uh, fire extinguisher monthly to make sure that the gauge is always in the green. And if you do ever have to use it, you want to remember the acronym PASS, P-A-S-S. You want to make sure that you pull the pin. There's a pin that's on the trigger, and the pin is there to prevent you from squeezing the trigger by mistake. If you don't pull the pin, you cannot use the extinguisher. So P stands for pulling the pin. A, you want to aim at the base of the fire, uh, standing about 8 to 10 feet away. Give yourself a good space between, uh, between yourself and the fire. Also, the placement of where you stand is important. You want to stand in between the fire and your exit. Okay, You don't want to corner yourself where you have no way out and the fire is in front of you. Because now if you don't put the fire out and you run out of extinguishing agent, you're in a bad spot. So you always keep yourself in between the two so that you always have a safe way out if you're not able to put out the fire. Uh, the first S is squeeze the trigger and the second S is sweep side to side, covering the entire pan with this extinguishing agent so that you put out that fire. Uh, moving on to electrical fires, right? Um, most of these fires are beginning in plugs, cords. Um, and what we're seeing is they're beginning in appliances that uh, generate a lot of electricity. And that's any kind of appliance that heats or cools generates a tremendous amount of electricity. So you're, there you go, you're talking about your air conditioners, your refrigerators, space heaters. Uh, that's where we're seeing a lot of these fires start. And we're gonna go into that in about 20 seconds. Uh, so they're talking about here, light bulbs and having the appropriate wattage, right? So any kind of light fixture that you have says what kind of wattage it recommends. So it may say 40 watts and you may say to yourself, you know, 40 watts isn't a lot of light. I want to put a hundred watt bulb in there. You're going to be able to put a hundred watt bulb in there, but it's the fixture is not made for that kind of wattage. So you want to try and keep the bulb to the same wattage that is recommended for that fixture. Uh, if you have any kind of cords that look like that, that are frayed and the, the wires exposed, uh, that's definitely not good. You want to make sure that you replace that cord immediately. Um, and keep your cords protected from damage. Anytime you purchase any kind of electrical item, you want to look for that UL label. Underwriters Laboratory is what it stands for, and that's a company. And what they do is they test and inspect all of these electrical items before they go out for sale to the public. And they put their stamp on it um, to say that it's been tested and it's been approved by Underwriters Laboratory. You want to make sure that you're using three-pronged uh, devices with three-pronged outlets. And why that is so important is because uh, a lot of buildings, these older buildings were not built with a lot of three-pronged outlets. And what happens is people are taking the third prong in the plug and they're snapping it off and they're plugging it into their two-prong outlet. And that's not a good um, practice at all. You can buy uh, an adapter that will allow you to adapt a two-prong to a three-prong, um, but definitely don't start snapping pieces off. If you have plugs in your home that look like that, uh, that's, a, that's a bad sign um, that you're overloading these outlets. It's called piggybacking and you don't want to do it. Um, what that's telling you is that you don't have a lot, uh, enough outlets in your home. Again, the problem was these buildings were built so long ago and a lot of things didn't require power like they do today. Everything we use now requires some type of power, whether it's to charge it, to use it, it's something is always requiring power and we don't have enough outlets. So people are resorting to these things uh, and what they're doing is they're overloading these outlets. Uh, and in the next slide, you're going to see uh, where we talk about um, these power strips uh, and all these other things. So the first thing we're talking about with this is avoid plugging any high wattage appliances um, into the same outlets or the, on the same circuit. And you should never be using extension cords or power strips with those items. They should be plugged directly into the wall outlet. So again, the high wattage appliances I'm talking about are any things that, that heat or cool. Uh, should be plugged directly into the wall outlet, no extension cords, and they should be on their own um, circuit. So talking about the power strips and the surge suppressors, um, something that's worthwhile to know is, and I'm sure there's nobody here listening that doesn't have one of these in their homes right now or at work, um, but these do not provide more power. What they do is they provide you more access to your outlet, but they do not give you more power. So you're going to plug this into your two plugs in your wall and it does not give you more power. You're getting the same amount of power as if you only use the two plugs. The only thing this is doing is giving you more access to those outlets, to that power that's in that in those outlets. That's all it's doing. Um, so you definitely want to make sure that you're not overloading this. Uh, these things should not be used for any high wattage appliances, right? These should be used for simple things, for charging your cell phone, um, you know, plugging in a light or an alarm clock, things like that. 
low wattage appliances, that's what these are good for. Uh, and make sure that if you do buy a, a, a power strip that it does say that is surge suppressed. Uh, not all of them are surge suppressors um, and they will look exactly the same. So you wanna make sure that you buy one that is surge suppressing and uh, what that will do is it will protect any items that are plugged into it from a surge that comes through the line should your neighborhood lose power um, and they turn power back on or something like that, it'll send a surge through the line and this surge suppressor will catch that surge before it gets to your appliances. Um, home heating fires, as we mentioned before, um, the major causes of home heating fires are poorly maintained systems. So the space heaters is the big thing here. Um, and we're going to get into the space heaters right here in the next slide. Um, a lot of people hate when I talk about the space heaters, um, but you want to give the space heaters uh, clearance. Uh, three feet around the space heater should be clear of anything combustible. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I believe it mentions it on the next one. Um, so there you go. So place at least three feet from any combustible material. Uh, you want to make sure that you're, and, and people hate me when I tell them this, but you're turning off and unplugging the space heater once you go to sleep. The space heater should be run in the room that you want to sleep in before you go to bed. While you're still awake, the space heater is running and it's warming up that room. When you go to sleep, you should turn off and unplug that space heater. It should really not be running all night long while you're sleeping. Uh, and I know a lot of people hate me when I tell them that. Um, you will wanna make sure that you're pur purchasing a space heater that has an automatic shut off feature. So if you happen to knock into it or somebody knocks into it or you know, uh, it just tips over by mistake, the space heater will shut off automatically, okay? If you have one that does not have that feature, the space heater is gonna continually run while it's tipped over and that is gonna heat up if it's on a carpet or if it's on a hardwood floor, it's gonna keep running and heat up that floor until uh, it ignites. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you have an automatic shut off feature to that space heater. And again, because it is an item that heats something, it draws a lot of power. And again, it should be plugged directly into the wall. Never use an extension cord. A lot of people use the extension cords because they want the space heater blowing directly on top of them while they're laying in bed. Now, number one, you're using an extension cord, which is a no-no, and it's within three feet of anything combustible, which is your bed, um, and that's a big no-no. So you want to avoid that uh, at all costs. Um, again, pay attention to the cord. The cord will become warm, which is normal. Uh, if it becomes hot to the touch, there's a problem. You want to unplug it immediately. And again, there's Underwriters Laboratory. This is an electrical item. Make sure that you're looking uh, when you buy a space heater that it has the UL marking on it to make sure that it's safe. Um, Moving on to smoking, smokers, this is a huge number, right? Smokers are seven times more likely than non-smokers to have a fire. So that, that's a big deal. Uh, usually my, my lecture for smoking material fires is to stop smoking, uh, but that's easy for me to say I don't smoke. Uh, so if you do smoke, just a few things that we're gonna go over real quickly. Nationwide, worth knowing, more people die in fire started by carelessly discarded smoking material than by any other type of fire. Uh, so that's nationwide and bedding is usually the first material to ignite because people are drinking or they're falling asleep and they have a cigarette lit and they're in bed. Uh, and it's very simple. Um, so we want to avoid that at all costs. You want to make sure that you're using the dark, the large deep ashtrays that you put water in these ashtrays or, or some kind of like old coffee can and that you put the cigarette in it and let it sit in there for a while to make sure that the cigarette is out. What happens is a lot of people take the cigarette and they run it under the sink. Uh, and then they throw it into the trash immediately. Uh, and they did not fully extinguish that cigarette. The cigarette's gonna sit there and it's gonna smolder in the garbage can for quite a while. You're talking a few hours before it really actually ignites. And the next thing you're gonna know in a few hours, you're already in bed and your kitchen's on fire from a cigarette that you threw in there three hours ago. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you're throwing it into some kind of jar of water for a while before uh, throwing it away. And obviously, you don't want to be smoking while you're laying down or leaving a lighted cigarette in an ashtray. Uh, these are all basic, you know, simple things. Uh, candle fires, uh, you know, we do see a huge increase in these during the um, holidays and stuff like that. Um, so moving on to the next slide, we'll, we'll see what happens here. Um, one of the things we do recommend is um, that you use flameless candles. Uh, they're battery operated. You don't have to worry about a flame. They look real. 
Um, you can use them with a remote control. You don't even have to get up to turn them on. You can turn them on from your, you know, from your couch. Um, and they're simple. You don't have to worry if you shut it off or if you knock it over or anything else. Uh, however, if you do insist on using a flame candle, you want to make sure that you're using one that has a non-combustible shade or a globe to it. You want to make sure that it's at least four feet away from anything combustible at all. Obviously out of the reach of small children and pets. And you should be extinguishing the candle before leaving the room that the candle is burning in, not the uh, house, right? It's not, I'm not saying leave, uh, blow out the candle before leaving the house. If you have a candle burning in the kitchen and you're going to go sit in the living room, you're supposed to be burning, blowing out that candle in the kitchen. Um, so keep that in mind. You never want to use candles as a means of lighting. If you lose power, you shouldn't be going around the house lighting candles. Uh, that's a very bad practice. Make sure that you have batteries and you have flashlights uh, just in case you do lose power. Never use candles um, in case you lose power. However, if you do have the um, flameless candles that are battery operated, then again, you can uh, easily use those for lighting as well. Uh, if you lose power. So uh, just another advantage to having the flameless candles as well. Um, early detection, we're going to get into the main potatoes, which is our smoke alarms. Um, installing and maintaining a smoking carbon, a smoking carbon monoxide alarm will reduce your chances of dying in a fire by 50%. That's a huge number, 50%. 70% of people um, that die in a fire die uh, in a home with a non-functioning alarm or no smoke alarm present. And there's a difference there. Um, we're saying non non-functioning or no alarm present because a lot of people have alarms, but they didn't change the battery or they took the battery out and never replaced it. So they have an alarm that doesn't work. That's as good as having, not having one at all. So just keep that in mind. You want to make sure that you're installing at least one combo alarm on every floor and one smoke only in every bedroom. Um, and just a little bit about placement of the alarms. They should be installed on the ceiling, not less than four inches from the wall. Uh, and that's really where we recommend they, ins they be installed. But if you can't, for some reason, install it on the ceiling and you have to install it on the wall, it should be placed between four and 12 inches from the ceiling. So it should be high up on that wall, um, if possible. You wanna make sure that you're testing your alarm at least once a month. And all you have to do is press the test button and it'll go through the series of sounds that it will make. Uh, if you're using the alarms with the removable batteries, you want to make sure that you're changing those batteries twice a year. And the easy way to remember that is when you change your clock, you change your battery. And just so everybody's aware, we are changing our clocks uh, in about a week and a half. So we should be changing the batteries in our smoke alarms uh, at that time if you still have one that has a removable battery. If you still have one that has a removable battery, not, not, um, it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, but you should be looking to change it to a 10 year sealed alarm um, that is has a battery inside. It's a lithium ion battery that's non-replaceable, non-removable. You don't have to worry about changing the battery anymore. Uh, these alarms are good for up to 10 years uh, and you can't take the battery out. You don't have to worry about changing the battery. Um, and these are definitely uh, a much better alarm, much smarter alarm. And again, you don't have to worry about changing the battery. All you do is test it once a month. Quick thing on the uh, patterns that you're going to hear with the alarms, a single chirp every 30 to 60 seconds is telling you one of two things, either that you have a low battery or it's a malfunction in the alarm. So you want to make sure that you check that. Change the battery first. If you're still hearing the chirp, uh, then it's telling you that there's a malfunction in the alarm and it's time to replace the alarm altogether. If you have a combination alarm, uh, your alarm's going to go off and you may not know why it's going off. So three long beeps is for smoke or fire and four quick chirps is for carbon monoxide. So you wanna make sure that you know the difference between the noises that your alarm makes because if it is making four quick, four short beeps, um, it's for carbon monoxide and you don't know that there's carbon monoxide there because you can't smell it, you can't see it, taste it, hear it. Uh, they call it the silent killer because you have no idea that it's there other than the fact that your alarm is going off. So you wanna make sure that you know the difference between these noises so you know how to react properly. If it goes off for carbon monoxide, make sure you open the windows, get outside and call 911 immediately. Something we do take for granted is fire safety for the deaf and hard of hearing. Uh, and the, uh, the alarms that we're gonna talk about here in the next slide, you go to the next slide, Kev. Um, you're gonna see here are bed shakers. 
Uh, and this one right here, so you're going to see a picture. On this picture here, you see a little smoke alarm on the top, and it's pointing to a sensor that's on the top of this alarm clock. And what happens is if that smoke alarm goes off, it sends a signal to this alarm clock. The alarm clock picks up the signal, and it's going to read fire on the screen. It's going to speak fire out of the speakers. It's going to say, fire, get out. And this little cord here with a little pad that you see that's vibrating, that cord goes under your pillow. Uh, and when the alarm goes off, it's going to vibrate under the pillow, notifying the person that um, that the, the smoke alarm has gone off and that there is a fire in the apartment. So this is definitely something you want to take advantage of for anybody that's deaf and or hard of hearing. Uh, it's a great thing to have. On the next, uh, the next slide, um, go ahead, keep going with that. Um, we're going to talk about planning. And that's the last thing we'll talk about is planning your escape. Uh, you want to make sure uh, that you have an escape route planned and a secondary escape route planned in case your primary way out is blocked by fire. And you should have this taken care of long before you have a fire in your apartment. You should be already doing this. Uh, and if you haven't done it already, you should be doing it immediately. Uh, on the next slide here is just a larger uh, scale of what a floor plan should look like. And it's pointing to where they have the alarms and where the different ways out of the apartment are. And this is something you should go over, especially with children, right? We, we use the example all the time that children have fire drills in school all the time. If those fire alarms go off in school, these children get up like robots and know exactly where to go and what to do without thinking twice. And if I ask these children if they do that at home, I guarantee that most, if not all, tell them no, they don't know because it's just the way it is, right? We get comfortable with it uh, and we take it for granted. So you definitely want them to be just as robotic getting out of their home in a fire as they would as if they were in school. Once you get out, you want to have a meeting place outside uh, that everybody meets so that you know that everybody is out safely. And that meeting place should be a good safe distance away from the home, uh, at least 30 feet away. Knowing your building is going to determine uh, your escape plan. So this is important to know whether you live in a fireproof or a non-fireproof building. Um, and if you're not sure what kind of building you live in, you can check with the Department of Buildings and it will tell you, they will tell you what kind of building you live in. But it should be posted in your building if you live in some type of uh, multiple dwelling or, or something like that or a multifamily building. It should be posted. Um, so go over the, diff the difference here. Um, and these are pretty basic except for one. So if you live in a non-fireproof building and there is a fire in your building or in your apartment, anywhere in that building, you need to leave immediately. It's, it's very simple. No matter where the fire is in that building, you need to get out. Uh, if the fire is in your apartment, you get out and you close the door behind you, okay? However, if you live in a fireproof building and the fire is in your apartment, again, you leave immediately and you close the door behind you. So those two are easy. This is where it gets a little tricky. If you live in a fireproof building, the fire is not in your apartment. It is usually safer to stay inside your apartment rather than entering the dangerous smoke-filled hallway, okay? It's a fireproof building. The building is made to isolate and contain the fire within the fire apartment, uh, provided the person closed the door and whatnot. If they left the door open, they're going to allow the fire and smoke to come out and contaminate the hallway. That's why you stay in your apartment, because if you come out and now you're stuck in this hallway where you can't see and breathe, uh, you're stuck. So you're definitely uh, usually safer to stay inside your apartment uh, if the fire is not in your apartment and that is in a fireproof building only. Uh, that's why it's very important that you know the type of building you live in. Uh, you don't want to try and fight the fire yourself. So one thing I didn't mention before when we were talking about the kitchen fires is that you can attempt to fight that fire but you have about 30 to 45 seconds before that fire is beyond your control. So you want to make sure that you call 911 immediately and get the ball rolling before you attempt to fight any fire uh, in your kitchen like that. Uh, what you don't want to do is start trying to fight the fire and then it gets out of control and then you start calling 911 because now you delayed the whole process of, uh, of us getting there. So you want to get that ball rolling as soon as possible. But again, 30 to 45 seconds is not a lot of time. So you want to make sure that uh, that you call 911 immediately. Um, so you, you don't want to stop and get your stuff together, right? Uh, they always talk about having a go bag. Uh, you want to make sure that you have this bag ready to go at your at your doorway so that you grab it and go if you 
need stuff to take with you that you're not gathering any belongings. Uh, use your escape plan that you went over, that we went over before, and use the safest or closest exit. On this slide, they're gonna tell you that you don't wanna be using the, um, the elevators, which is obvious. Elevators act erratically during the fire. You may get into an elevator and hit the down button and the elevator may go up. Uh, it may stop on the fire floor and open the doors out of nowhere. So you don't wanna use the elevators. That's why we tell you not to use the elevator. Um, you wanna obviously stay low under the smoke uh, as, as low as you can get. Uh, you may actually be able to see if you get low enough uh, and that's where you'll be able to breathe. Close the door behind you and contain that fire as much as possible and use the stairways. Um, yeah, the, the E911, I believe, is just getting started now. So, um, you know, I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, on the next slide, I think, um, so another thing that we do take for granted is, is strategies for families with members with autism. A lot of people don't think about that. But uh, something that's really important is people with autism respond well to routine. So you want to practice, practice, practice. Always go over um, escape routes and fire escape plans and what to do if there is a fire with them. Constantly go over that so that they feel comfortable with the motions of doing it. You want to wrap them in a blanket or a coat to give them that sense of security, that warm sense of security. And you want to pick a spot outside a meeting place that's familiar to them and that's quiet. Not something that's too hectic, not a place they've never been to before. Something that's very familiar to them so that they feel comfortable being outside. Um, so those are just a few quick tips on strategies on how to deal with um, members with autism if there is a fire. Um, and real quick, we're just going to go over some of the key points here um, that we went over during the slide. You know, I don't feel the need to read all of them. I know we went over all of this stuff, uh, but these are all some of the key points that we went over um, during this slide. And I think on the last slide, uh, again, is just some, um, some more tips, um, again, on all the stuff that we went over. Uh, during this whole presentation, uh, definitely things that you want to make sure that you keep in mind, um, you know, and that you share with everybody uh, in your family, in your home. Uh, I believe that uh, that concludes the PowerPoint. Yep. Uh, right there is FDNYSmart.org. Uh, that's our website for any and all information related to fire safety. You could download um literature on that website you can watch videos actually featuring myself um on a lot of different topics if you just want to review fire safety on electrical fires we have a five minute video on electrical fires and we do that for all the different types of fires for kitchen fires and smoking and stuff like that so uh all that stuff can be found on that website as well Okay, thank you so much, Captain Kazo, Kevin. You're very welcome. Kevin, can you yeah, unmute? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. I'm sorry about that. I was muted. But yes, uh, Captain Kozo, thank you so much for a great presentation and a great webinar. Uh, and I really hope everyone can take that information and implement in their homes. Uh, and just to give everyone a reminder, this, this presentation will be posted online, uh, as well as we'll be able to, to provide the slides to you in PDF format if you give us an email or let us know, uh, and we can get to that in a little bit. So again, my, uh, my name is Kevin Leung, and I'm from New York City Emergency Management. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about hurricane preparedness and really overall individual preparedness for you and your family and your household. So New York City Emergency Management, uh, our main goal, who we are and what we do is that New York City Emergency Management is responsible for coordinating emergency planning and response for all types and scales of emergency. It is staffed by more than 200 dedicated professionals with diverse backgrounds and areas of expertise, including individuals assigned from other New York City agencies. So that could be from the fire department, from the police department, the department buildings, and so on and so forth. And we really rely on these subject matter experts to support us at New York City Emergency Management. And our main goal, our main mission, is to really help New Yorkers before, during, and after emergencies through preparedness, education, and response. 
So in terms of preparedness, we have an entire community engagement department or bureau uh, consisting of various different programs to really engage the public and, uh, and get ready the public for any emergency that may occur. We have our Ready New York program, which really focuses on individual preparedness uh, and the residents of New York. We have our community emergency, emergency response team, which is the third, which is the third program, which really deals with the volunteers uh, of New York City Emergency Management. And the third team are all trained in basic response skills, including fire safety, like search and rescue, disaster medical operations, and traffic control. Uh, and throughout the COVID-19 response and the various emergencies that happened this year in 2020, uh, the CERT team has been front and center in supporting New York City and the various departments of New York City on all the different responses, and they are a tremendous help. So if you're interested in joining, uh, please shoot us an email or go on our website at nyc.gov slash, uh, slash emergency management, and you'll, be, and you'll be able to sign up. We'll also have a community preparedness program, which really brings together uh, a community organizations and local leaders to promote grassroots emergency preparedness and volunteerism. And our last program is the Partners and Preparedness Program, which really works with organizations, private companies to prepare the employee services and facilities for any emergency or disaster that may happen here in New York City. So, so getting into the thick of things, uh, we are still in hurricane season. Uh, the Atlantic hurricane season does begin from June 1st and it goes all the way through November 30th. And really the biggest time for hurricanes to happen in New York City is around June 1st, is, um, is, around, June, uh, is around August to October. Um, and if you guys don't remember, Hurricane Sandy happened in October 22nd, I believe, in 2012. So we are still in the thick of hurricane season, even though it is getting a little cooler around the area, please be mindful and please think about these things uh, and the hazards that a hurricane may uh, may have on New York City. So there's various impacts that a hurricane can give to New York City. Uh, there is wind, rain, flooding, and utility disruption. For Hurricane Sandy, uh, we saw a lot of rain and flooding along the coastal areas. Uh, rain usually comes about six to 12 inches or more, often results uh, often resulting in severe flooding, and that's what really happened in Hurricane Sandy. We saw a lot of flooding in, uh, in the Far Rockaway, Sand Island, Coney Island, and various parts of New York City. But this year, if you guys remember, we had Tropical Storm Atheia hit us in New York City, and it didn't really bring a lot of rain or flooding, uh, even though it did in some parts. The major thing that it brought was wind. And with any type of tropical storm or hurricane, there will always be large gusts of wind usually around 70 miles or greater, and that can really cause a lot of problems throughout the city. And what we saw was a lot of utility disruption. We saw a lot of blackouts, and we saw a lot of uh, services not having power because of, of the tropical storm at the East, and that is one of the biggest issues that can happen. So remember that a hurricane can be a lot of different things. It could bring all four different types of impacts, uh, or it could bring one or two. So remember to always be prepared and know what to do when an emergency happens, especially a hurricane. Now, when a hurricane comes, we have our hurricane evacuation zones. Uh, in New York City, we have six different zones divided up one through six uh, based on the risk of storm surge flooding. Uh, in the red, you see on the map here uh, in our my plan, uh, we have laid out from red all the way to green to white. So these areas of the city usually when if an evacuation is um, is mandated, we will say zones one, two, and three will have to evacuate and go to a hurricane evacuation zone, uh, a hurricane evacuation center. Uh, and this really comes from uh, the mayor and our leadership to uh, make these decisions. And we really urge people to follow uh, if you live in an evacuation zone to, to evacuate. Uh, our hurricane evacuation centers, there's about, I believe, about 60 hurricane evacuation centers throughout New York City, um, at least a few in each borough. And with each borough, we have uh, accessible shelters located throughout. So people always ask me, Kevin, I live in zone one, but the hurricane evacuation zone is so far from my home. And the reason why we have that is because we want to make sure that our hurricane evacuation centers are 
located outside uh, the risk of flooding or the risk of storm surge. So that's why you see in the map here on the right is that all these dots, all these blue dots, even though they could be a little small, are located in the white. Uh, they are outside of the purview of the risk of flooding and outside of the hurricane evacuation zones because we want you to feel safe when you are evacuating your home into somewhere else. So that is one of the reasons, and we really want to emphasize that a hurricane doesn't happen over New York City. Usually it comes from the south and it'll, cut, and it'll make its way up. So you do have some time to evacuate. So even though it is, uh, it is a gorgeous day, uh, 75 degrees, and a hurricane is coming, please be prepared for that, and please make sure that you are um, adequately getting informed uh, when an emergency does happen. So we live in a very weird time these days. Uh, it is We are still in the thick of the COVID-19 pandemic throughout the entire world. Uh, there are new rules, new new mandates that happen, and we also have taken that into our hurricane evacuation shelters. All of our hurricane evacuation shelters are requiring social distancing. Uh, we are requiring uh, safe coverings, and there will be daily cleaning um, multiple times a day in our hurricane evacuation centers. These centers are accessible for people um, of, all, of all walks of life. If you're a New Yorker for a day, if you're a New Yorker for 30, 30 years, it doesn't really matter. We want you to be safe. So these hurricane evacuation centers are open for everyone, regardless of status, regardless of where you come from, who you are. Uh, if you need a place uh, to stay, um, this place is for you because we want you to feel safe. And moving on, we really want to know how to be prepared. To be prepared is the first step in any type of emergency. We want to know what to do and how to be safe and how to make our family safe. Uh, you know, and since we are in this new day and age of doing a lot of stuff virtually, um, I'm not able to see you physically to give you the materials that I would really want to give you. So please, when you get a chance, go online to our website, nyc.gov slash readynewyork to download the My Emergency Plan. This is basically the uh, all in all book to prepare you and your family on any type of emergency that may happen. So again, this, this book right here is the, My, is the Ready New York My Emergency Plan, and that is what we'll be going through uh, and preparing you, uh, New York City residents. So within the plan, there is three simple steps. The steps are how to make a plan, how to gather supplies, and how to stay informed. And these steps really equal to your whole emergency preparedness plan for your family. And we'll go deep into it uh, one by one. So, how to make a plan. One of the first things in it is you want to make a plan with your family. You want to have the right steps, uh, how many steps, that's really up to you because every single person is different, but you want to have steps in your plan to know what to do, how to evacuate, how to communicate, uh, and the various things of what you and your family need to do in order to have a proper plan to be prepared. Some highlights that we want to really work on is you want to create an emergency support network uh, within your group. That could be friends, family, or whoever you and your family are really close with. We always want to recommend two in-state contacts or in-city contacts, uh, just so you can communicate with each other and really uh, work on how to be prepared together. And you also want to have one out-of-state contact. Now, people always ask me, like, why do we need this out-of-state contact? They're not here, they can't help us, uh, we can't go to them if something happens. Uh, and that really is for uh, information sake. So when the emergency happens, when a large-scale emergency happens, uh, usually the local phone lines are busy uh, because people are trying to call each other, people are trying to talk to each other, and they can't get through because the bandwidth of the local phone lines uh, is at capacity. Uh, you saw this, if you guys remember, in couple places or a couple times in New York City in the past 20 years. One of it was during September 11th when people were trying to call each other and phone lines were completely busy. Uh, and also during Hurricane Sandy, there were times in, uh, there were times that people were not able to get, get connected with each other because the, because the phone lines were busy. So we really recommend having an out-of-state contact where you can call that person and relay information for you and your family. So if my uncle Ben lives in California, lives in LA, I can call him and saying that, hey, Uncle Ben, uh, 
it's Kevin. I'm doing fine. I can't reach my parents right now, or I can't reach my wife uh, or my children, but I'm doing fine. I just left work to come home. I should be home in about an hour. Uh, my Uncle Ben in L.A. can call my family members here in New York City to relay that information. So that really allows you to be communicative and know where everyone are when an emergency happens. And communication is one of the most important aspects of how to, of how to make a plan. And within, uh, and within the My Plan, the My Emergency Plan, uh, as you flip through the pages, you'll see a whole page dedicated to your health and life-saving information. This is super important because when an emergency happens, we don't really know what our medicine are, um, what our insurance numbers are, uh, what kind of uh, medicine we could be allergic to. So having this page in your My Emergency Plan really helps you to properly prepare yourself when an emergency happens. You are able to write down your allergies, what, what, medical, what medical conditions you have, uh, eyeglass description, blood type, all the basic information that you may need or you may not know off the top of your head written down. And we really recommend making a copy of this and folding it up and putting it in your wallet if, uh, if you have a wallet or in your purse if you have a purse or on your person. Uh, so just in case when something does happen, you have this life-saving information to support you uh, when an emergency does occur because we know that emergencies don't happen. We don't plan for emergencies. They just happen. So as we move on from making a plan, we, we have the right steps. We have the right uh, people to uh, be in our support network, and we had most of our stuff written down. <clears throat> Captain Kozo also talked about gathering supplies. Uh, in, in different emergencies, you are required to do different things. Uh, if there is a fire in your home, uh, if, there, if your home is being flooded or something happens and you have to leave your home, you usually want to have a go bag, uh, a bag that is ready to go packed with your essential supplies uh, and in the My Emergency Plan on page 13, you will see that we provide you with a little brief description or uh, brief pictures of what you should have in your go bag. But you also want to supplement that go bag with the things that you may need for you and your family. So a man is different from a woman and a child is different from an adult. So every person in your household should have their own individual go bags that have their own stuff in it. Uh, so if I am married and I have two children, I will make sure that in my children's go bags, there will be maybe some toys or some games because that is something that they need to keep them occupied. Uh, that's something that people may not think about as adults, but as a parent or um, as, as a grandparent, you want to make sure that your children, the younger ones in your family, uh, have something to do when an emergency happens because what's crazier than an emergency is to have a child who's age five to seven that doesn't have anything to do uh, crying and not occupied. So remember to think about that go bag that works for you and your family. And that go bag should usually be left um, next to your door or somewhere accessible close to the doorway. When you have to evacuate, you can grab the go. Uh, you can grab the bag and go, hence the word go bag. Uh, but sometimes you have to stay at home. Uh, and we also want you to be prepared at home. You want to have an emergency supply kit at home. So some emergencies that can happen at home could be uh, a, um, a snowstorm. A snowstorm, you know, we usually recommend people to stay at home, to hunker down what we call quote unquote shelter in place. So you want to have supplies and things ready to go, ready to uh, be used when you have to stay at home. So in this thing, uh, in this, supply kit at home, you should usually have it in a large plastic container with about seven days worth of water. Um, and each day, uh, we recommend one person to one gallon. So if you have two people in a household for seven days, we recommend to have around 14 gallons of water ready to go or um, almost ready to go so that you are properly prepared. And you want to have other essentials such as batteries, flameless flameless candles, uh, flashlights, and things like that, uh, as well as the proper medication that you may need uh, for you and your family. Uh, doctors usually give you uh, extra weeks or, or extra months worth of prescriptions, so please uh, talk to your doctors about having extra prescription medicine uh, in case of an emergency to get that ready. Uh, and any other special considerations. 
So I talked a lot about gathering supplies for humans. So we also want to think about our pets. Our pets are also part of the family and they are just as much integrated into our preparedness plan as anyone else in the family. So if you do have a pet, make sure that that pet is also cared for in the essential supplies that he or she needs uh, are there and present, uh, especially if you have to leave your home. So again, everyone is different and I can't uh, play specifically on what each individual in here needs, but we want to make sure that everyone is properly prepared and have the right supplies for him or her and their family. So as we go on, we want to stay informed. Uh, in the last step of being prepared, we always want to be informed on how to be prepared. We have various different programs, various different apps that we have in New York City, uh, at, especially from New York City Emergency Management. We have our Know Your Zone campaign, which is your hurricane evacuation zone finder. You can find that online at uh, nyc.gov slash know your zone. Uh, and if you type in your address, you'll be able to find what, what address you live in or what zone you live in. We, all, we also have our Notify NYC app, which is New York City official emergency communications plan for the public. You're able to sign up. Uh, we have apps and we have these offered in various different languages. Uh, and you can sign up and have um, uh, emergency notifications sent to you as soon as possible uh, when the emergency happens. And you can also customize it to the zip codes you live in or you work in, as well as the, the information you want to receive. So you have children, you'll also receive information on when schools close and things like that. So this Notify NYC is really, really important and really helpful, especially during the times of COVID-19 when we were in the thick of it, we provided information to people uh, on status and updates and things like that. So when you get a chance, please sign up for Notify NYC. And we also have our Ready NYC app. Our Ready NYC app is basically the My Emergency Plan that I've been talking about throughout the entire presentation, but just mobile and virtual. Uh, so if you can go to the Apple Store or Android, uh, or Android Store, you are able to uh, download this app and basically have a My Emergency Plan ready to go uh, on your phone and hope you are prepared for anything that may come your way. So I know I breathed through it a little bit, but I really just want to, again, thank you, Captain Kozel, for the presentation. I want to thank you all for attending. Uh, and I will now open the floor up for uh, any questions that you may have. All right, I don't think there are any questions. So uh, just to go over a couple more things, uh, I know some people requested uh, the presentation, uh, the slides to email to them. If you can email us at readyny at oem.nyc.gov uh, and just say that, hey, my name is Kevin. Uh, I was at the presentation today. Please provide, if uh, you can provide the slides for me, um, that'll be great. Yeah, we'll get that to you as soon as possible. Uh, and this presentation is also being recorded. So we'll be posting this on our YouTube channel uh, if you want to share it with you and your community or anyone that may have missed this presentation. Um, and I really hope everyone has a great week. Uh, if there are no more questions, um, I don't believe so. Yeah, so yeah, again, if you guys have any other questions, please email me at readyny at oem.nyc.gov. Uh, and we at the, at the Ready New York team will get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, if you guys want the slides, give us an email. And really, I hope everyone has a great week and, uh, and a great fall and winter time.